It's hard to know exactly what sort of future Norman Borlaug envisioned when he first arrived in Mexico in the fall of 1944. Even with his native optimism, it's safe to say he couldn't imagine all of the successes that were to come his way. The Chapingo Experimental Agricultural Station near Mexico City was mostly weeds, and Norman Borlaug was barely two years out of the doctoral program in plant pathology at the University of Minnesota when he found himself packing up and moving to Mexico. A college wrestler who had failed his initial entrance exam and entered the university through its general college, Borlaug brought a host of talents to the job. As important as his intellect were his persistence, his optimism, his dedication and competitive nature and a willingness to work his fingers to the bone. These were qualities first learned on the Iowa farm on which he was raised and nurtured in high school by his principal and wrestling coach Dave Bartlema. Bartlema would wind up coaching Borlaug at the University of Minnesota as well. Borlaug arrived at the Twin Cities at the height of the Depression and was deeply affected by what he saw there. As a student at the university, Borlaug developed an interest in forestry and spent a summer working in the Idaho wilderness. He met and courted his wife-to-be, Margaret Gibson, and worked at a coffee shop as he studied. Then one day, he wandered into a lecture hall to hear a talk that would change his life. By extension, it changed the lives of millions of people around the globe. Its title sounded like a World War II propaganda film, the shifty little enemies that destroy our cereal crops. But its author was one of the most esteemed scholars on the campus, E.C. Stakeman. The shifty little enemies were varieties of wheat rust, the most devastating killers of that plant in the world and the object of much study at the U of M plant pathology lab over the years. At the end of the talk, Borlaug told a friend that if he ever went to graduate school, he'd like to study with his stakeman. That promise quickly came true. Not only did Borlaug begin his doctoral work in plant pathology, he soon became a department favorite, working with stakeman, C.M. Christensen, who was his thesis advisor, and others at the university, like the highly regarded Dr. H.K. Hayes. Dr. Stakeman worked as an advisor to the Rockefeller Foundation, which in the early 1940s was beginning a new program in agriculture. At his suggestion, the foundation hired a former U of M student named George Harar to oversee its development. World War II had brought with it the probability that millions of people would go hungry without the means to feed themselves. The Foundation wanted to put American agricultural scientists in the field to help developing nations in this work. The first assignment was to be in Mexico, and Stakeman and Harar thought they knew the right man for the job. Norman Borlaug's assignment was as straightforward as a wheat field. The Rockefeller Foundation wanted him to develop better plant varieties to withstand all those shifty little enemies and help feed the population of Mexico. Borlaug did the job well. He established a program of shuttle breeding, which allowed him to speed the process of testing various wheat varieties by planting both spring and winter crops in different locations in Mexico. He taught native agronomists how to spread the word of what he and the others at the International Center for the Improvement of Maize and Wheat, CIMIT in the Spanish acronym, were doing to promote better crops. And he worked tirelessly, cross-breeding a seemingly endless variety of wheat to create an ideal plant. Success came in the form of an unexpectedly short-stalked plant. It turned out that high-yield dwarf wheat, built strong and compact like a college wrestler, was able to better support more kernels, and it didn't complicate the harvest by falling over in the field. We searched for many years to find the particular parents with genes that would telescope or reduce the height of the plant but wouldn't affect the number of grains per head that were set, or the size of the head, or the size of the grain. 
In a stunningly short period of time, Mexico was not only able to feed her own population, but to actually export part of its crop. Borlaug's successes at Simit brought him a modest level of fame, which he was willing to exploit to help spread the word about his work. Borlaug envisioned his work helping people all over the globe. But to take it beyond Mexico, to Pakistan, India, Asia, and Africa, he needed to become something more than a good scientist. He needed to polish his political and diplomatic skills and become an ambassador of his own ideas. By the late 1960s, a sense of urgency pervaded Borlaug's work. World population was growing at an exponential rate, and most people doubted that it was possible to feed the staggering numbers of hungry people around the globe. But by convincing the powers that be that what he did in Mexico could be exported as readily as a shipment of grain, Borlaug helped change the world. In Pakistan and India, the harvests of wheat became rich enough to feed enormous populations. To many, it felt like a miracle had occurred. They called it the Green Revolution, and its acknowledged leader was Norman Borlaug. There can be no permanent progress in the battle against hunger until the agencies that fight for increased food production and those that fight for population control unite in a common effort. Fighting alone, they may win temporary skirmishes, but united they can win a decisive and lasting victory to provide food and the other amenities of a progressive civilization for the betterment of all mankind. In the blink of an eye, Norman Borlaug had graduated from his days as a student of the University of Minnesota to worldwide fame and the Nobel Prize. This was not a man who rested on his laurels. There were many more years of great and hard work to come, more mouths to feed, more nations and leaders to be won over by his ideas. In 1974, just two years after President Nixon's trip to China, Borlaug made the first of several trips to that nation. His continuing mission helped promote yet another remarkable agricultural revolution. Working with Japanese philanthropist Ryoichi Sasakawa and former President Jimmy Carter in the 1980s, Borlaug helped establish a program that would bring improved crop yields to Africa the continent most endangered by the prospect of famine. Borlaug continued his hard work as the 20th century neared its close. With the financial assistance of John Ruan, he created the World Food Prize Foundation, an organization dedicated to rewarding scientists and humanitarians who, like Borlaug, worked at alleviating the problems of hunger around the planet. No other foundation had ever assumed this role. Norman Borlaug always enjoyed teaching and working with youth. One of his great dreams was realized with the creation of the World Food Prize Youth Institute, an organization that brings high school students from across the country to the World Food Foundation each year to interact with Food Prize laureates and international food science experts. All the while, Borlaug continued his work at CIMIT in Mexico ever polishing his ideas, ever perfecting his plans. Though wide fame eluded him, the world's leaders understood his contributions to mankind. Norman Borlaug won a remarkable trifecta of awards. The Nobel Peace Prize in 1970, the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1977, and the highest civilian honor in the United States, the Congressional Gold Medal in 2007. To his very last days, a part of Norman Borlaug remained that young man, fresh out of Iowa, who first arrived at the University of Minnesota in the early 1930s. He loved to reminisce about his student days, to talk about Stakeman, Hayes, Harar, and others in the plant pathology department, about his admission to the university and appreciation for the general college about his days as a wrestler at the U and helping to bring that sport to the whole state of Minnesota. A few years ago, 
ABC News anchor Peter Jennings did a profile of Borlaug. In one portion of the story, Dr. Borlaug was seen wearing the bright maroon and gold jacket of the University of Minnesota. The next day, he happened to be driving around Des Moines, Iowa, with the head of the World Food Foundation, Ambassador Kenneth Quinn, when Quinn took a call on his cell phone. It was the president of the University of Iowa, wondering what size jacket Norman Borlaug wore. He wanted to send a Hawkeye coat as quickly as possible. As proud as the University of Minnesota is, that Dr. Norman Borlaug was one of its graduates, it knows that its claim to him is tenuous. Long ago, he dedicated the greatest part of himself to the cause of feeding the hungry. And the world is a better place for his efforts.